everybody. I hope you enjoyed your beer and or candy. Um, so before I get too far into things, I want to thank my company, Invisium, because uh, frankly, until they actually prodded me to do this talk, I really wasn't sure I was going to be able to pull it off. Um, and they actively encouraged me. And so I probably wouldn't be here today if they hadn't really convinced me I could possibly pull it off. Um, so I don't know if you're, you like your applications to be secure, but you know if you do, then we can help with that. So you should talk to me later. Um, so I've been thinking a whole lot about choices lately. And there are times in our lives where we, we encounter a fork in the path, um, where we, we, we stop to take stock of where we are, uh, decide where we want to be, and then we pick a direction that we think is going to help us get there. Now, sometimes the choice is really easy because, you know, the choice seems trivial or obvious. For instance, I have a standing policy that the answer to would you like to have a cookie is always yes. Um, but sometimes it's trickier. Uh, the choice is uh, obviously important, uh, but we may not even feel as though we ha it's, it's really ours to make. And, uh, you know, just last week I went in for uh, a regular cancer screening that I've been doing for every several months for the past, uh, past two years now. And uh, for those who don't already know from Twitter, I had testicular cancer. And I, I suppose I could choose uh, not to do these, these screenings, but it, it doesn't really feel like a real choice that I have. Um, you know, that being said, don't feel bad for me because uh, I had a lot of fun with my cancer. Um, first off, you know, testicular cancer is highly survivable. And secondly, y you get to make all kinds of horrible jokes and nobody can say anything to you because it's like, <laughs> hey, I, you know, I have cancer. <laughs> Um, you know, my wife is a saint for putting up with me during that time. She really, she, <laughs> she really is. Um, and you know, and for at least the first few days, the puns were nuts. They really were. Um, you know, after that, they were just nut, of course. Um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, a few months ago, uh, Terrence tweeted this at me and I had a choice to make. And, you know, months before, this is, there's some backstory here, because months before at RailsConf, uh, I talked to Terrence and Davey about an idea that I had had for a talk. And, uh, you know, Terrence knew what I would be presenting on um, if I submitted. But the problem was that it was going to be a lot more work than any talk I'd ever given. And I wouldn't have a whole lot of time to prepare because I had other obligations that I had to take care of during this next few months. And, uh, you know, Terrence... Um, is a good salesperson. He, he convinced me that since I could back out, I should go ahead and submit. He's, he's sneaky like that. Um, so what was the idea? Well, when I was a kid, I loved these choose-your-own-adventure books. Uh, the thing that I really loved the most about them was that, you know, not only didn't I know how they, the ending was going to turn out, but uh, I got to have a say in how we got there. And, you know, for, for an eight-year-old, uh, this was a, a huge sense of control. And so, the idea that I had was for a choose-your-own-adventure talk. Now, I've never seen anyone try giving a talk like this. Um, of course, that could very likely be because it's a horrible idea. Um, but I've decided that if there's any place that I can potentially get away with trying something a little bit risky and out there, it's a keep Ruby weird, right? So what I'd like you to do now, oh, yeah, keep Ruby weird. So. So what I'd like you to do next is, uh, bearing in mind that the Wi-Fi may not play nicely, uh, you may want to use your phone, um, I, this is how it's going to work. Go to choices.ernie.io in a browser, whether it be your phone. Uh, look, it, so far, current versions of Safari, Chrome, Firefox, iOS, Android, even Windows Phone and Internet Explorer, if you're a freak, um, those, those should all work. Um, and the, you know, the nice thing about writing an app that's going to be used by developers is you don't have to support IE8, so that's nice. So I'm watching, oh, we got 53, 54, good, oh man, holy crap, okay, so far so good. Nothing broke yet? Okay, I'm just waiting for folks to get connected. So let's see if we can make this work. Um, pick an animal, we have in contention cats, dogs, squirrel monkeys, and Venezuelan poodle moths. Um, and we give you a moment to vote. Poodle moth is really getting no love at all. All right, so it looks like dogs are going to win, so we're going to go with dogs. All right, so you get a big picture of a dog, and you get one extra bonus picture of a dog for making that choice. Okay. So 
Remember these things? You know, when I, I, I walk right past them now, but when I was a kid, um, these things loomed in front of me like uh, genies in so many lamps, right? I had a, if I had a quarter or, you know, if I could bomb a quarter from my parents, I would stand in front of these machines and I would just agonize over, over which choking hazard I was going to purchase. Um, <laughs> And uh, the sticky hands were a constant favorite of mine. I think they're one of the all-time best vending machine toys, in my opinion. <laughs> sticky hands, getting some love. So you've seen these things before, right? The uh, gel wrist stress. So many years ago, I had one that looked pretty much exactly like this. And it had started to fall apart. So when I pulled off the cover, I made the most amazing discovery, you folks. And uh, it turns out, It turns out that these things are basically made of the same thing as sticky hands are made of. So it's you know, super stretchy, and it, this one is, they don't make them like they used to. But, you know, it can, it can, we used to have fun, like, flinging this thing at people and, like, flinging it at the wall, and it would walk down, and, you know, we could pick, the, we could pick things up with it. And um, it's just made of massive amounts of the same, same stuff. It's really sticky, actually. So anyway, um, one day, we made the decision. We named ours Roderick. I don't know why we named it that. We just we gave it a name. It was named Roderick. And everybody in the office had fun with him. And so we made the decision to see just how far Roderick could stretch. And so I grabbed one end, and my friend Jeff grabbed the other. And, uh, you know, he just started walking. Now, he got really far, too. Now, because I'm about to drop some science on you, I am very thankful for my gift. So give me just a moment. That's not going to end well. Okay, see if I can do this one-armed. Because you can't really deliver science without a coat. I really don't think. All right. So, in physics, there are two kinds of energy, primarily. <laughs> one is potential energy. This is the kind of uh, energy that you build up whenever you pull back on a slingshot or, you know, hypothetically speaking, when you stretch a gel wrist rest across the room. Um, and then there is kinetic energy, right? This is energy in motion. So when you release the gel wrist rest or the, the slingshot, there's also in science a little thing called gravity. You may have heard of it. Now, at about this time, Jeff decided to let go of his end of Roderick. I remind you now of where I was holding my end of Roderick. <sighs> Potential energy quickly became kinetic energy and gravity doing what gravity does. You might imagine what happened next. Uh, on the bright side, I have half the surface area for that particular attack vector these days. <laughs> My point with this is that choices have consequences. You know, otherwise, what's the point, right? Um, if we're going to make choices that have no consequences, then why make them at all? So it's a law. It's almost as inescapable as gravity. Um, so if our choices are bound to have consequences, it makes sense that we would want to uh, have some control in, over them and optimize them. So what will we use to try to do that? I am shocked that this thing is not broken yet. This makes me very happy. Oh, it's like neck and neck. This is great. Okay. It looks like instincts. No, nope, it looks like... Stop it. <laughs> All righty. It... All right. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It's instincts. Oh, and it switched to brains right when I clicked it. Oh my gosh, okay, fine, it's brains you folks. Okay, okay, so we're gonna use our brains, and there's only one problem with that. Our brains are huge liars, really big liars, complete liars, and in fact, uh, a cognitive psychologist named uh, Peter Wason uh, conducted a, a well-known experiment uh, where he presented people with the following sequence of numbers, two, four, six. He told everybody that this sequence of numbers followed some sort of a, a rule, and participants were allowed to guess uh, as many sequences of numbers as they would like and ask whether or not they conformed to the rule. Now, they then had to try to infer the rule that Wayson was using. Now, because we don't have time to get everybody to guess sequences and numbers, I'm going to ask you to pick a sequence that doesn't follow the rule. OK. Wow. You're doing very well. Um, OK. so. The, the thing is, what I just asked you to do is called indirect testing of a hypothesis, and it's a lot 
Uh, that's something that we often don't do. I prompted you uh, to do it just now. Um, and so it makes things a little easier. But normally we form a hypothesis and then we think of the results we'd expect them to be. And that's exactly what happened in Wason's study. You know, participants would find a sequence that satisfied the rule that they had in mind. For instance, a lot of them would say even numbers or numbers incrementing by two. And they would consider, continue to test the exact same hypothesis with every sequence they supplied, even once they were told that that was not the rule. Uh, they'd say stuff, they would get really complex. They'd be like, uh, pi, pi plus two, pi plus four. You know, and, and for the record, the answer was 642, and his rule was just increasing numbers. It was much simpler than anybody was thinking. Uh, another thing that our brains uh, tend to do, you're, you're probably already familiar with the, uh, the phrase, a little knowledge is a, is a dangerous thing. Psychologists call this the Dunning-Kruger effect. And put simply, it means that those who know the least think they know the most because they don't know what they don't know. And um, the interesting thing, I think, is that it's obvious when you think about it that obviously we can't see our own blind spots. That's why they're blind spots. But um, side note, by the way, I love the title of this article that Dunning wrote, We Are All Confident Idiots. That's, that's, a, fantastic, <laughs> that's a fantastic name for an article. So our brains also love a good story. And in fact, we love them so much that our brains are constantly making up stories that we tell ourselves. And we call that uh, the narrative fallacy. And it's basically when we assign importance uh, to events, even, even when there's no uh, sense to them at all, we just weave a narrative that makes sense. Uh, that's why it's called the narrative fallacy. And, and you know, just because a story is convincing to us doesn't make it right, doesn't make it true. You know, it could be true, um, but that's not the same thing as it actually being true. Um, another thing that our brains do, during, uh, during World War II, we created a branch of government called the Applied Mathematics Panel to do war math. The, uh, the military called in the Statistical Research Group, which was actually part of the Applied Mathematics Panel, uh, to help with a serious problem. As it turns out, you had about a 50-50 chance of making it back alive if you were flying a bomber during this time. And the military knew that what it really needed to do was add more armor to the bombers, but it obviously couldn't cover the entire bomber with armor because if it did, the thing wouldn't take off. Um, they wanted to keep them in the air. That's, that's a good uh, principle for, for airplanes is that they go into the air. So um, they had records of where the planes that had returned from enemy territory uh, had actually taken the most damage. And so over and over again, they saw bullet holes accumulating along the wings, around the tail gunner, and down the center of the body. And so they went to the statistical research group and they asked them, please use your war math to help us decide where to put the armor. And so... As it turns out, and you folks are doing very well on this, by the way, you're, you're really impressive, very impressive crowd, and I'm not just saying that because I want you to like me. Um, so as it turns out, uh, we have something called survivorship bias, and what, what we were actually, what everybody else was doing was they were looking at the planes that came back and deciding, well, the most bullet holes are in these places, this is where we need the armor, but they were neglecting to realize that these planes made it back. The ones they have to worry about are the ones that didn't make it back, which probably have holes other places. And so the holes showed where the planes could be shot and still survive the flight home, but uh, the armor needed to be elsewhere. So none of those places needed armor. But we're not really any better. You know, we, we have heroes. We look to rare success stories in our industry. And, you know, we, we strive to emulate their success. And, you know, all the while, we miss out. We miss out on opportunities to learn from failures, both theirs and our own. You know, even if we were to ask our heroes to candidly share um, their failures, their honest answers would be tainted by the same narrative fallacy we talked about just moments ago. You know, they, like we, are just as likely to overemphasize reasons for their results and, uh, and to downplay the roles of things outside of their control. And this is just a small selection of some of the ways that our brains can't be trusted. And so <laughs> when we put it that way, it really... <laughs> We sound pretty hopeless, right? <laughs> so all kinds of factors conspire to influence our choices and our outcomes. Wow, this, this one's actually an easier one to call. All right, let's just go with internal. All right, I can get behind that. Uh, we clearly can't trust ourselves to always make the best choices. So in my younger years, I went on a few hay rides. Um, you're familiar with these, yeah. Um, you know, folks think it's a great idea to load a bunch of people into the back of a trailer filled with hay. Now, as somebody who's had a long time allergy sufferings, I'm not really, this, this perplexes me as to why anybody thinks this is a good idea. Still, I went on a few. And, you know, on the bright side, 
there's always a bonfire, uh, and, and you get to have hot chocolate and marshmallows and hot dogs and stuff. So that's cool. Um, so the hayride's over. We're at the bonfire, and I'm standing off to one side. I'm minding my own business. And uh, to my surprise, two very attractive young ladies came by to chat with me. And this really confused me because I was nowhere near as handsome as the two young men in this purchase stock photo here. Um, this was me. <laughs> Eat your hearts out. So naturally, naturally I panic. I actually start trying to think, you know, <laughs> I think, what would a cool person do? And I'm, this is literally what's going through my mind. I'm thinking, what would a cool person do? And so the only thing I could really think of that I'd seen cool people do was, you know, they, they kind of lean against the wall and they prop their leg out like, this. Like, yeah, I don't care, you know, I'm totally chill. You know, there was a problem with this plan. Uh, you know, as it turns out, there was a basement window that was directly behind me. And so the spot I decided to prop my, my leg up on actually sent shards of glass showering down onto, uh, into a basement kitchen where two elderly ladies were making hot chocolate for us. Um, so that went very well. Um, so I want to talk about something a little different um, relating to internal factors. Um, I, have, I have regularly uh, assumed that the stuff that's obvious to me is obvious to everyone else. And for a long time, yeah, this is great, right? Somebody actually felt the need to put a warning label on a bag of peanuts that says it contains peanuts. Um, for, for a long time, this, this kept me from sharing code. Uh, for, and it definitely kept me from doing anything regarding speaking. So uh, for at least two years, I'd been filling out those stupid uh, uh, yearly review uh, worksheets. You know the ones where, where it's like, what are your goals for the next year? And then later, they'll review and see if you hit them. And I had regularly put public speaking on those. But I, I, I hadn't really taken any steps to do it. So on January 1st, 2013, I made a resolution. And I posted it on my site to uh, keep me accountable. I picked the entire internet uh, as my accountability group because I suck at boundaries. And so a few weeks later, uh, I had two conference speaking opportunities booked. And it is two, this is like a few weeks after I said that I was going to try it. And my first ever speaking opportunity was in Texas, actually, at Big Ruby uh, a couple, few years ago. And I'm going to be forever grateful to the organizers of that conference for giving me a shot. But that same year, I got to go to, to Moscow and speak. And I got to keynote RubyConf, which I had privately set as a, as a five-year goal. Uh, I hadn't really told anybody. And then this year, just, uh, just a couple of months ago, I got to go to beautiful Barcelona and speak. And more importantly than any of these things that happened from that result, um, I actually got to make so many friends during the past few years that uh, I, they've enriched my life so much. And I'm so thankful for everybody in this, in this room that I, that I can count as a friend. I'm just so thankful for you all. And I think that it's really interesting because all of this was just because I chose to shut down that little voice inside of me that was worried about what other people would think. So I don't ever claim to be the smartest guy in the room. And uh, it turned out that the hayride and the, the speaking thing actually had a few things in common after all. They weren't completely different. Um, I didn't recognize this until a lot later. Um, but Nearly every time I've opted to be inauthentic um, because of what someone else might think, I've missed out somehow. And, you know, look, I want to be very clear. I am not you. I, this is not a prescription for what you should do. But what I'm saying is that the patterns you might see in your life are going to be different. But uh, I can promise you that if you spend some time, you know, you're going to spend the, your entire life stuck with yourself, like it or not. So if you spend some time figuring out these kinds of patterns, it's going to be worthwhile. So which one are we? Okay, so we're agents. Now, when we say we're agents, we don't mean we're like Horatio Cain, though I think we can all agree that would be awesome. Um, what I mean is agency. We're talking about agency, and this is the power that you have to shape the world around you in ways that are large sometimes and sometimes small. An agent is something you are. And with that, I would like to uh, point out that that's on your bingo card, that you are an agent. And, uh, yeah, Krago, I think is how you pronounce this. 
I have Krago now. I don't have time to collect my hug from Aaron, so unfortunately I'm going to have to put that on hold until later. Um, so I believe that as a member of the human race, you're an agent. Your choices are shaping the world around you. And the interesting thing is that, you know, we exert our agency whether we want to or not. It, it just happens. Sometimes it's involuntary, but we're still shaping the world. Now, if we contrast that with a victim, I want to be very clear what I mean when I say victim. We are not talking about people who have actually been victimized. There are people that have actually been victimized, and this is not what we mean. We're talking about a victim mentality, and this is a really important takeaway. Uh, while an agent is something you are, a uh, victim mentality is something you learn. And I'd like to think that if it's learned, it can be unlearned. There are plenty of situations where maybe even you really are victimized, but you can choose not to let the victim mentality take over. I've been volunteering as a counselor for about seven years now. And I've dealt with folks in some pretty desperate situations uh, that I would not wish on anybody. And some who are pretty far towards the other direction on the spectrum. And in my experience, there's actually very little correlation between the people who are victims and the people who exhibit victim mentality. I've gotten pretty good at guessing when this is going to become an issue, though, that we're going to have to deal with when I counsel folks. Um, and you folks seem to be pretty good at it, too. Uh, all of these things can be indicators that there's a victim mentality involved. But by and large, people who feel powerless are going to usually resort to passive aggression. They go to passive aggressive mode because because they have difficulty acknowledging their anger directly and because of the way they feel about themselves. So I'd like to think, though, that there are situations, even that we genu genuinely can't control, you know, things happen, life happens. But we should be looking for things that we can or even did control. Even when you can't control the outcome, you can control how you react to it. And this is something that sounds really trite, but it's something I have to constantly remind myself of because that might be the only control that we have in some situations. The point I'm trying to make is that you're an agent and agents choose. I'm going to make a guess that at least uh, a few of you recognize these two images. They're the uh, symbols of the Alliance and Horde, factions in Blizzard's MMO, uh, World of Warcraft. Years ago, I played World of Warcraft. Like, I played a lot of World of Warcraft. <laughs> oh, poor me. This is a screenshot of a, a friend in me uh, posing with King, Ma king Magni Bronzebeard. He's the, uh, the Dwarven King. We were the only two Dwarven Grand Marshals on the Argent Dawn server. If you know what any of that meant, uh, we should talk later. <laughs> So I swear there was a point to this. We'll come back to it later. Um, if we're agents, we are literally always making choices. We're making them, whether we're conscious or not, and as Rush told us, even if we choose not to decide, we still have made a choice. So uh, hang on. I have something I need to do. All right, we'll see how this goes. Have fun with this. It's actually working. Oh, man, this was the thing I thought was going to crash. Uh, so the problem is we make so many choices without realizing it. Um, in my World of Warcraft story that I promised I would get back to, um, Grand Marshal was, a, was a, a, a rank that you had to attain by playing a whole lot of PvP or player versus player activity. Um, in PvP, uh, you had to, at the, the very last ranks as you were grinding for Grand Marshal, you had to put probably at least eight hours a day into the game. Now, I had a regular day job. I, uh, I still put my eight hours in to get Grand Marshal. I was operating on about three hours of sleep for uh, <laughs> Select Star for Music. <laughs> I love you folks. Um, so, I'm. <laughs> so distractions. Anyway, okay. So I'm like, okay. 
uh, I need to be Grand Marshal. I got really invested in this Grand Marshal thing. I'm putting in eight hours a day on that. I'm putting in at least eight hours a day on my job. I am trying to have some family life. I'm trying to, you know, like, take care of things like feeding myself, which I hear is important. And so all of this I'm putting in, all this effort that I'm putting in, I'm getting no sleep. And I go to a new job. I start my new job. And I go into uh, a meeting one day, and I almost fall asleep in front of my brand new boss because I had put eight hours in the night before, and I was one day away from getting my grand marshalship. Um, likewise, <laughs> likewise, the <laughs> there's a reason this is up for so long, by the way. And the point is. Um, in this particular story, right, I didn't realize at the time, but I was using, I was using, making a choice to, to emphasize these accomplishments because I wasn't feeling like I was making much accomplishment in the rest of my life. Um, at the time, I was in a failing marriage. Um, I was in a very unhappy situation in a dead-end job as far as work went. I was um, probably borderline depressed at that point, and I was putting in this time because at least I felt like I had some control. I was making that choice at the time unconsciously. I hadn't reflected on it at that point. I didn't understand what was going on, but that's what I needed. Um, you know, likewise, we work all day sometimes, and we run out of time, and you know, we think we underestimated how much time we had, but we didn't. We chose to be distracted. Guess what? We probably got up in the morning and we got online and we got on Twitter and checked Reddit and fired up IRC and Slack and all of these possible things. And then we look at the end of the day and we realize, well, there were all of these things that were so incredibly distracting to us and we think they just happened. But we chose. We opted in. We turned on that fire hose. Look, it's good to make good choices, but it's even better to understand why you make them. And it's even better than that to start noticing the choices that you didn't even realize you were making. And you know, look, even good choices uh, might not be the best ones. For instance, let's say, you know, we're, we're talking hypothetically here. Um, maybe you've got writer's block for a talk that you're working on and you want to take the time to build a fully functional chat application for a single slide to <laughs> show on your screen. Um, all right, anybody have anything last to say? Because this is going away. Ooh, the helicopter will stand by us forever. All right. So, <laughs> you are fun. Okay. So, this, uh, this by the way, is Yak Bieber. I found him yesterday online. Um, this is about... This is about intentionality. We have to choose our choices. Sounds very meta, right? Be conscious about the choices that you're making. I, like, I had no idea how this was going to turn out when I told Terrence yes. As of three days ago, I was building this very slide you're looking at right now and stressing out over you know, whether I had chosen the, uh, the right content to include. And I didn't even know how it was going to turn out when I got up here on stage in front of you because there are a lot of slides in this talk that you never saw because of the choices that we made along the way. Did we choose wisely? Well, that's the thing. The, the real adventure is in not knowing how the story ends, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you.